Okay, well, good evening and welcome everybody to the National Aging Research Institute's inaugural Conversation in Aging series. My name is Associate Professor Frances Batchelor and I'm the Acting Director of the National Aging Research Institute. Um, I'm joining you from Canberra today, so I'd like to start our meeting by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people on whose country I am located today. As we meet from many parts across Australia, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and waters across Australia. I pay my respects to elders past and present and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, including members of the Stolen Generations. I'm very, very um, much looking forward to what I think will be a really exciting and interesting event today. And it's really great seeing you all here for this very interesting conversation. So just a few housekeeping matters. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be publicly available on our website after the completion of the, seminar, uh, the webinar. And this will include um, the chat and the QA discussion uh, from your boxes at the bottom of the screen. Please do type your comments um, and questions into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. I think uh, a lot of times in these webinars, a lot of comments are very insightful and thought provoking. So I really do um, ask you to do that. We'll try to answer some of the questions, but we are, have got a very tight agenda this evening. So we may not get to those questions. So, before I introduce you to our conversationalist tonight, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the National Aging Research Institute and where the idea for this event came from. Nari is a national leader in ageing and aged care research and highly respected across the health and aged care industry and the research sector nationally and internationally. Uh, for over 45 years, we've been dedicated to improving the lives of older people. And our vision is a world where older people are respected, healthy and included. As a leader in translational ageing and aged care research, NARI is an independent not-for-profit organisation that brings together a range of different groups, older people, family carers, educators, policy makers and industry to influence ageing research and, as I said, improve the lives of older people and those who care for them. NARI um, staff have extensive and expert knowledge of healthy ageing, aged care, diversity, and of translational research and expertise in co-design and cross-sector collaboration. In previous years, we've um, run a director's lecture series, which has considered issues relevant to ageing and aged care. We had international experts talk to us about the latest science in areas such as dementia prevention and healthy ageing. However, as with this pandemic, um, as it's continuing to unfold, we're increasingly interested, I guess, in the portrayal of older people and how their voices are heard within public discourse. So we hear sometimes that older people think that they feel invisible, and that their voices are not heard. So we want to change that. And conversation, Conversations in Ageing is a bid to do so. Through engagement with prominent older Australians, we seek to explore perceptions around ageing, the different facets of identity in later life, and challenge any ageist stereotypes or assumptions that might exist. And when it came to identifying who our first conversationalist should be, Laureate Professor Peter Doherty AC immediately came to mind. Over the course of the pandemic, we've increasingly heard from him on the radio and in the media these past few years, and we think he is a voice of reason and hope. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce him today. So Professor Peter Doherty is, is an Australian immunologist and pathologist who with Rolf Zinkernagel of Switzerland received the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 1996 for the discovery of how the body's immune system distinguishes virus infected cells from normal cells. After leading a research group 
at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia and teaching at the University of Pennsylvania. Peter headed to the Department of Experimental Pathology um, at the John Curtin School of Medical Research in Canberra and served as chairman of the Department of Immunology at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, there's a lot to read here. It's uh, such a wonderful um, biography. Um, so in 2002, he joined the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Melbourne and from 2014 has been at the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity, a joint venture between the University and the Royal Melbourne Hospital. He is the author of many books, including The Beginner's Guide to Winning the Nobel Prize, A Life in Science, Sentinel Chickens, What Birds Tell Us About Our Health and the World, The Knowledge Wars, The Incidental Tourist, and most recently, An Insider's Plague Year. So we have an interviewer who will be, will be not interviewing, I guess, but asking questions of Professor Doherty. And today that will be Professor Bianca Bridgenarth, who leads the Division of Social Gerontology here at the National Aging Research Institute. And she also coordinates our education program. Um, Bianca's disciplinary training is in medical anthropology and public health. And her research expertise is really um, amazing and broad, cultural diversity, dementia and mental health. And within these boundaries, she's undertaken several studies exploring mental health and culture, mental health and the life course, and dementia and cultural diversity. She's got a fantastic track record over four, uh, I'm, I'm quadrupling your number of publications there, um, Bianca, over 100 publications, a sole authored book. Um, she currently leads several digital, digital media studies in Australia and in India, and most recently was re inducted into the Victorian Multicultural Honour Roll. So with those impressive bios, I'd like to welcome Professor Doherty and Professor Bridgenath to have a conversation about ageing. Great, thank you very much for that warm welcome, Francis. Um, and welcome uh, to you, Peter. It's great to have you here with us tonight. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So, um, Peter, I wanted to start off um, by you're a very eminent scientist. And these past two years, we've heard a lot um, from you in the media about COVID-19. I want to start by asking you your, your personal experiences of it and the associated lockdowns in Melbourne. What's the pandemic been like for you as an older person? Well, um, of course, I'm acutely conscious of the nature of the disease uh, from what we understand of it. And there are many areas we don't understand well because I've worked on viruses and immunity and pathogenesis as, is where I started out as a pathologist on how viruses actually cause disease and how we handle them. So I've been acutely conscious of the fact, of course, that older people are much more vulnerable that's uh, common in virus infections. And uh, it reflects, of course, that our immune systems don't do as well as we get older. So my experience of the pandemic has really been uh, that we've been um, somewhat locked away and we still are. There's a lot of virus around. It's very active and we're wearing masks whenever we go out into any sort of crowded area. Many aren't, but uh, but I think um, maybe more of us should. And um, so it's been a very strange time really, because prior to that, my wife and I were frequently doing three or four round the world trips a year, speaking in various countries and very engaged and actually getting a little bit tired, quite frankly, because age was taking its toll. Uh, all that stopped. So in a sense, I think it's improved my health, <laughs> but in other ways, of course, uh, this this experience of being locked down is, is it, it does get trying, as we all understand. Certainly. Now, do you feel that as the pandemics unfolded in Australia and internationally, that in some quarters of public discourse, that older people's lives uh, were viewed or seen as less valuable than younger people's? 
That is that there were certain ageist assumptions uh, about how we should uh, approach or think about older people in uh, the COVID response. Well, it was older people who are dying. And in Australia, we locked down very hard uh, at some economic cost and also some cost to younger people. It, it is perceived, of course, it's the older people who are dying. I, we don't know exactly who is dying of Omicron in Australia. We're waiting to hear more because we're, we're not hearing as much, quite frankly, because the whole thing has gone on the back burner. But my understanding is the great majority of people who are dying either of or with COVID are more than 80 years old, which I am, but they have other serious comorbidities such as uh, um, um, bone marrow tumours and this sort of thing where they're being treated with immunosuppressive cytotoxic drugs and so forth. So I think the fact that Australia took such aggressive action on the national level and the people went along with it does reflect a certain concern for those who are dying with the disease. Of course, we we're all scared of it too, because it's a new disease. We don't know where it's going. It would be a mistake though, to think of this only as a disease of the elderly. I'm very concerned about the large numbers of younger people who may have problems with this long COVID problem, which I'm reading into now and trying to understand. And it's, uh, it's difficult, it's complex, and there's a lack of, quanti of good information because we've only been doing this for two years after all. And so the publications and the detailed studies aren't necessarily out there. But I, I, would, I think it's a mistake to think of it only as a disease of the elderly. And I'm also very concerned, particularly with these Omicron variants, that a lot of people are being reinfected in fairly short order. And sometimes the reinfection can be worse than the initial infection. So yes, it, this has targeted particularly the elderly and some countries, uh, Sweden particularly, thought that they could just protect their elderly population and, uh, and let life go on as normal. It, it didn't actually work very well. And do you think that um, in some quarters of the media that there's been an idea of, that there's been a bit of ageism that's crept in about the value of older people's lives? Honestly, um, my media exposure is pretty oh. much uh, restricted to the ABC oh. uh, reading, um, uh, the conversation, which I had a little bit of a role in getting started, and I, I hope everyone reads the conversation, and I hope that many of you who have got academic appointments are actually writing for it. Uh, I guess you all know about it, but it's there as an academic blog. The intention is to get academics, and you have to be in a university or research institute of some, or something of that sort, to write 800 word articles on something that you know about or you're passionate about. And it then goes through a professional newsroom of journalists and who then make it accessible to the broader community. And it's there then available under Creative Commons. That is anyone can republish if they uh, don't change it and acknowledge the source. So I read the conversation, I read the Guardian online, I read the age online, um, I will not, under any circumstances, pay money for anything from Murdoch Media Organization. And uh, I read the New York Times and the Washington Post online. I should read The Economist, but it's expensive. <laughs> Fair point. You might be covering it off in the conversation anyway, which, yeah. is, uh, which is a good thing. But look, I mean, it, it, you, you obviously reading very widely from a, a, a variety of uh, media sources and outlets. And I guess, what can we take away from that kind of engagement uh, with media and with public discourse about how older people should, should contribute and be part of it? Well, I've always been a, an avid politics watcher and my politics are progressive. Um, I lived for almost 30 years um, 20 plus years in the United States and then probably another 10 years part time in the United States. And uh, in the US, I'm a liberal Democrat. In, in Australia, I'm not quite sure what I am, but uh, I'm a, my, 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 I, I think we need progressive politics when everything is changing. 
I mean, if you uh, recall uh, the great novel, The Leopard, um, uh, there's one of the characters there said, in order for things to stay the same, everything will have to change. And I think if we think about what's happening at the moment, that's exactly right. If we want the way we live to stay as good as it is, a lot of things are going to have to change and change very quickly. So I'm very concerned about, um, about reality because I'm a scientist and scientists engage with reality. That's what we are supposed to do. That's our job is to try to understand, explain um, and ameliorate the threats and so forth that come from the natural world in particular. Of course, social science is another area as well, which is massively important. And they're, they're studying human beings, which is a very, very difficult animal to study, I must say. I think uh, lab mice are much easier. But, um, but I think uh, as a natural scientist, uh, there are, there's grave concern. And uh, I've been very focused on this after the Nobel Prize, up, up to 1996 and the Nobel Prize, I was very focused on the life as a, of a laboratory researcher, famous in my field. Uh, but being famous in your field in science is like being about as famous as a minor figure in a coffee commercial that hasn't run for 15 years. So, you know, nobody knows who you are except the people in the field and you don't even know the famous people in the other field. So, um, so, but then I, the Nobel Prize suddenly confers this weird status on you where you're supposed to know a lot more than you actually do. So I became much more engaged in things like climate science and, uh, and what's happening generally in the community uh, as it's in, influenced by science and have been um, kind of appalled by how we've responded politically. But uh, I'm, I, I think if I was studying again, maybe I'd start out as a psychiatrist rather than a natural scientist. Well, as you say, human beings are a, a, a recalcitrant, badly behaved bunch. Uh, They're strange cattle too. I started as uh, in the veterinary background and, uh, and that's, uh, that's a saying from Africa and one of the African tribes, uh, the strange cattle. But. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so you sort of talked about how you've transitioned from, you know, being a, a laboratory scientist and, you know, famous in your field, and then you've engaged more and more with public discourse and various issues and, and uh, the politics of the day as you've gone along. Um, what advice would you give for uh, other people uh, about, and but how they should contribute to the public discourse in a meaningful way. Well, of course, now we can all contribute to the public discourse uh, through social media. And I think social media can be great and it can be terrible. But I think you can use social media to to discuss, to find out. I mean, uh, sometimes following you know, my culture is an academic culture, and, and I particularly grew up in the British type of Oh dear. Has been but it's often been a very good source of information and quite I've learned quite a lot in various contexts. So we can all use social media in various ways, I think, but we have to limit the amount of time we spend on that because it can be a, a tremendous drain. And uh, and I've been backing off it recently because I've achieved what I wanted to do, uh, get rid of the previous government. Uh, I don't put that achievement solely down to me, but I certainly tried hard to do it. And uh, I think um, it, it, I think social media, you can get good information out there. I think if you want to get scientific principles out there, for instance, it's a, a little video on YouTube where you're using cartoons or even hand waving. Uh, is much more effective than the written word. So there's a great democratization on the interaction and publication because in a sense with social media, we're all publishers. And I think that's got its positive aspects. The negative aspects, of course, is it's damaged the, the investigative journalist culture, which at its best is a wonderful culture. And uh, that, that's been harmed. And we haven't quite put anything uh, to replace it uh, in place, but, um, 
and, uh, but I think all of us uh, can be out there involved. But I think you have to decide what you're, as, particularly as a young person, you have to decide what your focus is and what you're going to be known for and what you're going to make your reputation for. And in science, that, that takes a pretty dedicated persona. So, Peter, you said something really interesting, which is that you joined social media for a purpose, and um, that purpose was to get rid of the previous government. No, no, that, 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 that's only very recent. That was only <laughs> okay. No, I joined okay. social media. My publishers got me into social media. Yeah. The people at Melbourne University Publishing, yeah. when Louise Adler was running yeah. it, got me into social media, and the yeah. idea was that that might help to sell books. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do publishers want to do but yeah. sell books? I mean, authors kind of like it too, but you quickly become accustomed to the fact that if you're author in Australia, in Australia you're not going to sell a whole lot of books. But um, so I got into it for that. And my, my actual, um, I had before the pandemic, I had 18,000 followers, and I spent very little time with it. And since now I have 113,000 uh, because I've been very active on it, um, uh, particularly mainly to try and help people understand what's happening with COVID and vaccination and all the rest of it. Though I do, I do also use it to, um, to um, try to highlight uh, issues that I think are important and try and draw them out. Yeah. So as you said, social media can be terrific. We can also be terrible. It can, yeah. So I guess um, you probably had negative views or feedback directed towards you on social media <laughs> sure. uh, for your for your opinion on things. Um, I think you know, it can be a bit intimidating for for some to go on those forums to to kind of put those views out and then to right. to basically cop a lot of criticism and abuse. Um, so two questions. One is, you know, how, how do you respond to that, and I, what would you tell others? Yes, honestly. I mean, the only social media I'm active on is Twitter. I, I, I'm not on Facebook. And, and so with Twitter's, you, you can get a discussion going on Twitter and you can get some quite good information. And, and actually some of the threads you get on Twitter, say on, say, long COVID or, or some of these things can be really good. I mean, with, with professionals contributing their insights and so forth. So, so it can be really informative and helpful. I pick up quite a few references actually on on uh, social media, but I I would I tried initially to engage with people who attacked me, and um, sometimes it, you, you, it, it's hard to gauge. But sometimes people are angry, but they they really genuinely want to know something, and I do still try to engage with people like that. But then you get a whole lot of people who are just crazy. I mean, they're, they're, they're sort of rigid anti-vaxxers, not people who are concerned about vaccination and so, so forth or something they may have heard and they'd like to have better information, but people who are just absolutely rigid and, and simply hate the idea of it or, or hate you because you, you sort of are trying to tell people about it. So I, I've learned basically that the best thing to do is to block them. So I think I, the advice I would have, I, you know, Twitter has a block function. And the advice I would give to anyone, if someone is, is attacking you and they're being abusive, simply block them. They don't, then they no longer exist. And they don't waste your time because these people are a time sink. And if you get emotionally involved with it, of course, it will, it will damage you. And there's no, you shouldn't have to be subject to that. It's a form of abuse and it's often a form of anonymous abuse. Yeah, I think so. That's a, that's a good point to, to make, I think. Yes, um, just block. In fact, I would love a button on the email. That, that... <laughs> oh, look, I think you'd, you'd, there'd be another Nobel Prize in that if you could create that. I, look, the, the, the email people could do it tomorrow, but they don't. I mean, you know, basically, to be polite about it, I would like an F off button on the email. <laughs> Wouldn't we all? Yes, I think we would. I think we would. I, I, was, I was getting regular emails for some sort of beauty thing. Now, that seems totally inappropriate. You're just going to look at me. So... so. 
Well, I'm not going to make any comment no, about no, your yeah. aesthetic appeal, but I'm going. Uh, but but uh, but I think it's an interesting point. To, uh, I wanted to go back to what you talked about here about even a, a video on YouTube or you know a few sort of moving hands and and a bit of um, that sort of um, I guess more visual material um, that can can be can render some of the science that we do much more digestible. Um, but do you have any sort of tips for the scientists who might be in the audience today about how we might make our work more approachable to the public? Well, well, I think if, you know, visual demonstrations of physical phenomena can be very good. I mean, if, you, if you're skillful in drawing or cartooning or any of that sort of thing, uh, good YouTubes can be great. Uh, on the other hand, you know, with all of this, what's really important is to try to engage with the respect, uh, and and try to and try to try to draw people out if you can. I I found that after after the Nobel Prize, I was used to talking to scientific audiences, but the year after the Nobel Prize, somewhat oddly, though I was living in Memphis, Tennessee, I was the Australian of the year. I mean, the rules were different then; they just appointed someone who'd achieved something, and and you were Australian of the year. So I was out here three or four times from the US, going to all the capital cities and touring around and giving talks to town halls and all that sort of thing. Totally different type of experience. What you find very quickly is even if people, for instance, ask a totally crazy question in an in a, in a in-person audience, um, and most of the people in the audience think it's a crazy question, but if you put them down in any way, you lose your audience because people have that sense of fairness and respect. And so what you've got to do is try and formulate something that can be helpful or, or at least seem helpful to the person who, who's questioning you on a very, on, on this issue or that, and, and just treat them with the respect as human beings. And if you, I think we all find that if we do that through our life, we get through it somewhat better. Now, at times, you may disagree totally with the person in question, but um, it's uh, it can be hard at times. Mm. A difficult one to, to navigate. And do you think um, uh, that, I guess, if we're not taught enough in science about how to engage with uh, with the public and to, to engage in a I don't think we're disrespectful as a community, but but how to engage in the in a respectful way? Yes, I, I I think the people who are good on the school debating team are probably heading for law or something like that. Mm -hmm. So not for not for science, uh, but some scientists and some young scientists are really very good science communicators when they find their feet. It may take a little bit of time to get used to it, but. Um, some people are just good at explaining things in a general way and doing it in a way that's not hostile and amiable, and that's what we should try to do. And you can practice on your relatives and so forth. They once said, you know, if you um, if you can tell your grandmother what it's about, then you're doing pretty good. And and the response was, well, my grandmother's an astrophysicist. So. Well, that's a high bar to set, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so don't make any assumptions about mm. it. I think that's always important. Don't assume. Yeah. So that, that point about assumptions is a really good one. So do you find that as you are um, an older person yourself, that people make all sorts of assumptions about you uh, on the basis of age? Uh, and how do, you, how do you respond to that? I expect they do. Um, and I'll make different assumptions depending on whether they're just seeing an older person or whether they know who I am. So those assumptions will then be very different. Um, but um, yes, I guess so. But I sort of bumble what through life as, uh, as I've always done. <laughs> yeah. There are several but when um... people when I travel a lot on the, well, before COVID, I traveled a lot on the tram. And, and uh, the, there was an age when suddenly young people started standing up for me, <laughs> which is which is kind of so. Did that work for you? Yeah, fine with me. I mean, you know, I was quite glad to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Good. But I mean, I guess one of the things is that as people age, um, you know, you sort of, you can sometimes start to experience a bit of ageism 
Uh, sometimes on social media, there's lots of other isms that people might experience. Um, you know, racism. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've mm. been abused and mm. um, quite quite forcefully on on social media and i just block those people but mm. but a, an age um, component can come come into it um, mm. um they, they're trying to be as offensive as they can and succeeding mm. I suppose. but I, I i just let it flow by yeah i mean aging is inevitable and uh, the alternative is not great so yep so what do we say i guess or what would you say to older people who who want to engage in the public discourse and who might fear being um, ridiculed or abused on the basis of age or um, any other sort of um, aspect of their of their um, gender or um, it's, it's interesting if we, if we look at figures on the media some are older and and they're, they're they're quite effective and respected they many of them have been around for a fair while but I think if people are coherent and and um, and put some and put a view and a message that people find interesting. Um, I, it, it, you get, there's always an initial uh, sort of reaction. And a lot of those conditioned reactions that we had have changed. I mean, I grew up in the British Empire and, and, and the conditioned reaction at that time to someone uh, from another part of the empire, from Africa was very different to the conditioned reaction now. I think we've become, you know, progressively um, much more colorblind, for instance, which is, is absolutely great. I mean, it's the stupidest form of prejudice there is. But, um, but I think our conditioning, particularly after over the last uh, 10 years or so has really, has really, we're no longer conditioned in the way that so many were for so long. Australia was a very, very different country in the 1950s from what it is now. And that's a good thing. Absolutely a good thing. It was a very boring place, actually. <laughs> All right. I, we're, we're Anglo Irish. I mean, God, how boring can you get? <laughs> All right. So we're, we're running out of time. So, and, and I want to give a few of our early and mid career researchers a chance to ask a few questions. But I, I have to end by asking you about the very infamous Dan Murphy's tweet. Yes. Well, that might have been a bit of an aging, aging moment. Now, you know, we, we do get these senior moments, and I am getting more forgetful. But I was actually on, on the computer and I was working. I had the email open, I had Google open, and I had Twitter open. And I meant to type into Google uh, what were Dan Murphy's opening hours, and um, I put it instead into Twitter, um, which uh, my uh, my Twitter handle is Prof PC Doherty, which is unfortunate. And I, I shouldn't, I, I don't particularly want to be a prof on Twitter, but I am. And and so suddenly, I mean, because what Prof says to a lot of people is this is some sort of weird person who does does weird nerdy things which is actually true for a lot of my life actually i've done weird nerdy things but um but um uh, i think the dan murphy tweet suddenly said well this guy's just an idiot like all the rest of us and so, which is true and uh, uh and so that was humanizing and it greatly increased my number of twitter followers very rapidly since then though um my wife and i made the decision about a year ago we're giving up drinking alcohol which we have so Dan oh, Murphy's. I go to Dan Murphy's for non-alcoholic beer. So. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a that's a good insight to know. And I look, thank you so much for your wisdom and your laughter. I've had a good chuckle um, listening to this, and I'm very tempted about this button on email. Um, but I, I am going to use the opportunity now just to hand over to um, Dr. Jessica Cecil, who's got a question for you. Um, Dr. Cecil's research focuses on healthy aging, public awareness and public perceptions of aging and aged care systems. So I'll let Jess ask her question over to you, Jess. Hi, Peter. It's been lovely to hear from you this evening. Um, so you have discussed uh, in part some of the pros and cons of using social media uh, to engage with information. How do you feel that the advent of social media has changed how people, and especially older people, uh, engage in public discourse, uh, such as new research findings and policy development? Well, in a way, if they're engaging, and some older people do engage quite 
quite strongly. Many, many don't, I suspect, but uh, there's a lot more information available very readily. I mean, you know, I've, I've been writing books um, since, I mean, my first book was published at the age of 65, and uh, my eighth book will be published in August. And um, I had, most of my research is now done online uh, and very quickly and very effectively. It's extraordinary. It's an extraordinarily powerful, and um, the internet is obviously extraordinarily powerful if you're researching something. You can get to all sorts of sources very quickly. So I, I, I think it's extraordinary. And uh, there's bad information out there too, but there's never been more good information out there readily available to anyone who, who can deal with it. I actually wrote a book about it called The Knowledge Wars, trying to, trying to tell people how to engage with, say, open access science publishing and, and how to evaluate what you're reading and how to understand it. Because, you know, an academic paper is a completely different writing form. It's a, it's a rather weird, formalized uh, writing form, in fact, a scientific paper. And uh, for people, and when people look at it, they need to understand uh, why it's written like that and what it's about. For instance, if you're sending a paper to, uh, to, to Nature, one of the big journals, for example, after it's been reviewed by about 17 people over two years, it may, may be almost incomprehensible. Or you may have ended up with a discussion section of the paper that's trying to appease all these various people. That may not be what you think. So uh, you've got to weight the various parts of a research paper differently. So. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay, I think it's over to me to ask um, Dr. Andrew Gilbert um, to ask his question. Uh, Dr. Andrew Simon Gilbert is a research fellow in social gerontology at NARI. He's an emerging researcher in health and aged care systems, including organisational issues and policy. So over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Francis. Um, yeah, you spoke a bit earlier about Twitter and how there was actually some quite good quality information on Twitter and good mm. quality discussion and discourse. Um, so my question is, and it sort of follows on from um, the previous question, do you have any thoughts on how we might include older people who are not digitally savvy in um, this public discourse? Gosh, I do. not really, you know, I'm sort of, you know, being, being hammered with technology all through my science career. I mean, the, the way we approach our science questions is so transformed in so many ways from what it was when I started out. The nature of science itself has transformed, particularly biology, molecular science. And, um, but I, I'm not, um, I, I, I don't understand, you know, honestly, I am older, I mix with some older people, but they tend to be people like me. And, and how, uh, how you would engage people who are, who are out of this, uh, this I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I have particularly useful insights. So um, I'd suggest that they get their, their grandchildren to start them off on it, though they're, they're much more savvy than we are. What do you think? I mean, that, how, how would you go about that? It's more in your area than mine. Um, I think what you've just said is exactly right. I think primarily it's through grandchildren and um, connecting the family, sharing photos and, you know, older people want to be involved and included in that sort of thing. Yeah, um, I, I suspect that, um, I don't know, you know, I don't use Facebook, but I suspect, I know a lot of people exchange family photos through Facebook and all the rest of it. And I'm never engaged with Instagram, so. It's, uh, yeah. Oh, thanks, I, think all, uh, I think all research operate all operations uh, like yours and like our institute, for instance, we really need effective social media departments that are groups or individuals that are really using social media to get good messages out because it's a very good way of contacting a lot of people. I mean, when you look at something and you you, you put it on Twitter and then it's retweeted. Uh, in some cases, I've had things retweeted several hundred times. You know that that's going a lot to a lot of people potentially. I mean, I I know that because I'm also attacked from the United States. 
Yeah, it has a broad reach, doesn't it? If, it if, does, yeah. Um, yeah. And you've got to remember whatever you put on Twitter is a publication in a sense. Yeah. So you've got and to stays there that. in the public <laughs> for time immemorial sometimes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, um, Peter and Andrew. I'd now like to ask um, Dr. Anita Go to pose a question to Peter. Anita Go is a clinician researcher and clinical neuropsychologist, um, and her expertise encompasses mental health, cognition, aging, and dementia. And she's a, re a senior research fellow um, at the National Aging Research Institute. Thanks, Prof. Um, I want to ask. So I'm kind of kind of what are the practical things we can do to improve people's perceptions of older people? Um, so how can we kind of better hear their voices and perhaps change the perceptions of older people in our society and perhaps hear about how to make the best of ageing and longevity? Well, you know, we hear a lot from some older people until recently we were still hearing from from some of the rock singers that uh, that are they're as old as I am, you know, so. Um, so I don't think there's a hostility there, whether their audience is still that older audience or it, it really goes much further down. But we do hear from some some quite effective older people who are who are in the popular. Um, Jimmy Barnes, for instance, is not exactly young, I and mean, so we're hearing from these people. There is a there is a there is a voice out there, um, but um, uh, I mean the more uh, sociological or, or psychological aspect of it, I'm not really well, very well qualified to answer it. Um, neuropsychiatry, that's, uh, that's a, uh, and, and cognition, uh, is that, uh, are you working at the, the, at the, le the level of the physical science of it or as, as um, and now I'm asking you questions. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we can answer that later. Well, I'm, you know, I'm I'm very, very I'm, I'm I started out. I, I, I trained initially in veterinary science, which is pretty odd. But then I did neuropathology for five years. I'm very interested in cognitive neuroscience and uh, and what's happening with some of this stuff. So, do you think there's a role for kind of upskilling older people, whatever people call old, in kind of the digital literacy that people are talking about in the chat? Yeah, um, how does that work? Skills? I mean, if you know. So if you're talking to people in nursing homes or, or, or retirement communities, is, is there a, a sort of an, an effort there to, to upskill people in that sort of context? Or is there, is there kind of a, a desire on, on the part of people to learn more? And, and uh, it seems you've got relatively captive communities. And, uh, and, and what's the resources that are available and what's the resources for training that uh, are available? And I, I expect a lot of that could be done through volunteers and not, not actually be costing anyone anything. And it might add to, uh, add to the um, enjoyment of life because I think uh, you can get quite a lot out of what's accessible uh, via, via the internet and uh, um, entertainment, I mean, some of the tweets are very entertaining at times. I think being part of society, I think that's a completely... It, 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 I mean, Twitter particularly is a discussion, if you care to use it that way. It's an information sharing and discussion format. Peter, we've got a few questions for you in the Q&A box, um, <clears throat> which I'll just read out. Uh, the first one from Anne-Marie Mahoney, which says, do you have genuine hope that the new government can reform aged care services in Australia to improve the quality of care provided. In your position, are you an influencer in the political space? I, I'm, I'm not talking to politicians. Um, I'm not involved with politicians. I mean, I like, I, I respect a lot of politicians for the effort they put in. And you can see, um, you can see that a dedicated politician works very hard and it can be a very, very draining experience for, for someone. So I'm, I'm not really involved with politicians in that level. In fact, a lot of what I do is when people ask me to do something, basically that's my role, my role at the Institute. I'm, it, my name's on it, but I'm the patron which means I have absolutely no administrative power and I shut up uh, unless, uh, unless they ask me to do something in, in most things. But, uh, so, so, but I think, yes, I think, I mean, we, we've got a progressive government now. We've got now, it's a very odd situation. We have the Labour Party, a progressive party, which also has elements of great conservatism within the party. 
I mean, it's a mistake to think there are not conservative elements within the Labor Party. And it's a very, it's our oldest political party. It was there at Federation. It's the only party that was. And, um, and then we've got, they are now our new conservative party. And to the left of them, we have the Greens, which will push them even harder and, and sometimes are really very uh, um, quite, um, uh, shall we say, imaginative in some of their policies. And so, so yes, I, I think the Labor Party is always much more um, focused on social justice than than the conservative uh, uh, parties. That's just the nature of the political systems. Um, in fact, that's the major difference for, from between the two. I think so. Social justice will always always rank higher, and I've, I think there is great concern about what happened in some uh, in what has been happening in the aging industry some of the exploitation that's gone on and and really some uh i i think you cannot leave areas of this just up to market forces or you get a very bad outcomes and i think we saw some of that so i think that will change yes great now i'm gonna i'm gonna move you from the the aged care system and the discussion on Twitter, now back to COVID. Uh, we've got a question here from Kathy Roth, who says the younger generations have seemed more skeptical of immunizations and mask wearing than we of the older generation. Will this have significant influence on new and, and evolving diseases of the future? Yes, perhaps, um, but we've had very good vaccine uptake in Australia. Um, at least for the first two shots of the vaccine. I'm, I think it would be good if more people could get that third or fourth shot, depending on their age, because what's happened is that the vaccines are, of course, against the original Wuhan strain, and the virus has changed a lot, and the Omicron strains are much more changed than, for instance, the Delta strain. And it, it is the case, and much to my surprise, it is the case that getting that third or vaccine, fourth vaccine shot is bringing up some antibodies, and these are our primary protective uh, mechanism, against Omicron. So that's odd. And I think what we will be seeing over the next, um, in the latter half of this year, at least in the United States, we'll be seeing an Omicron vaccine being rolled out, which will boost that up even further. So I think at, the, at this stage, I, I think it, it's wise if you're younger to get that third shot, if you're older to get that fourth shot of, of the vaccine. Now, um, the vaccines are not stopping us getting infected. They, they can limit it, but they're not stopping it. And uh, they can limit the likelihood we'll get long COVID, but they may not stop it um, completely. But it is the case that the vaccines are keeping most of us out of hospital. And there's a general agree agreement in the clinical, uh, concerned clinical community that that's the case. And if you stay out of hospital, the manifestation of what we're calling long COVID will be much less severe on the whole. I mean, part of what we're calling long COVID is actually, it's what, it's what we've known for years as PICS post-intensive care syndrome. It's, it's due to damage that's uh, to major organs that can partly be repaired, but not completely be repaired. So, so it's worth getting the vaccine, both from the point of view of a less severe consequences in the acute infection and less severe long-term consequences. The questions are coming in thick and fast, but I am also conscious of time. I'm going to hand over to Francis. Um, I'm, and uh, we'll we'll try and uh, capture some of the comments and questions later as well. Thanks, Bianca. Um, for me, this has been a really interesting um, conversation. It's been, I, re I think, an eclectic tour through your career, Peter. Um, the good and bad of social media, making science accessible, um, the so-called nerdy things that we've heard about that you've done. But I think... It's also been about breaking down assumptions and about humanity of ageing. Um, so I'd like now to hand over to Associate Professor Michael Murray, who's chair of the NARI board. 
um, to make a few reflections on this conversation. Uh, thanks all and thanks very much, uh, uh, Peter, for leading us off. Um, it's interesting how uh, through much of my life, um, older people have been categorised and typecast um, and how sometimes and it's evident even in a couple of anonymous questions, uh, people, the cognitive bias is such, um, or maybe it's stereotype thinking is such that it encourages or creates expectations that old people should only be commenting on or in a very limited sphere and that they're not keenly engaged in social justice, need for inclusivity and re reducing exclusion and prejudice, which many of which are these topics you've obviously directly spoken to. So it's sort of interesting when you look back at historical perspectives, um, and if you go to the distant past and look at operetta, operas and, uh, and, and many of the classical uh, literature, older people were typecast in a very negative sense. Um, you know, Merchant and Venice, um, you know, older people were either lecturers um, and preyed on the young, or which there's relatively little evidence that, that that's entirely true, although not it, it, there is some truth to the myth. Um, or else they were they were in in some ways a negative influence. Um, and and one of the great things about seeing somebody such as yourself and talking to somebody such as yourself is, in a sense, your um, it's nothing to do with age. Um, there's obviously wisdom and experience. Um, and there's no doubt wisdom, you've got to have both experience and quite frankly, some common sense. Um, but the ability to comment on a wide range of issues has been, for me, very refreshing. And to me, it's really an epitome of, of successful ageing. You know, to maintain a keen interest in a whole range of things, uh, not just being typecast um, as, as though one should go quietly into that good night. Yeah, which, I, which... I think so. And one of the things that annoys me, is, just infuriates me about television uh, is interviews. I mean, people would come and want to interview you for television and they would want you in a white coat in the lab. So you see this, at, you, to be a medical scientist, you've got to be a white coat in a lab. To be an engineer, you probably have to be standing by a large greasy machine or, or a bridge or something. And this just drives me nuts. I mean, you know, at my level of seniority in science, I'm on a computer or I'm talking to people. That's what I do. That's what I was doing through the last 20 years of my active science career. I wasn't in a lab. And so you'll see these guys in their white coat trying to work out how to use a microscope because they've forgotten or holding a petri plate up to the light. And so I discovered that the best way to get rid of, and, and television interviews are usually useless because they take say 15 minutes and they cut it to 15 seconds of totally meaningless nonsense. So I, I discovered the, the way to get rid of them was saying, I will not under any circumstances wear a white coat and I will not go into the lab. <laughs> So, so it's it's these prejudices, and, uh, prejudices, I think. But I think you know, my generation or the part, the community I grew up in, we grew up with an idea of service. I I never grew up with an idea of entitlement or expectation. That I didn't come from that part of society. But I I grew up with that idea of service, and that I think has been the the ideal of many of the people I respect in science and in other areas uh, who are who are middle aged, older and so forth. If you retain that concept that you're there to do what you can to make things better. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm very grateful. Back to Francis, I think. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Peter. And thank you to our wonderful audience. We've had over 200 people here today, which has been fabulous. And we've um, been able to take note of some of the comments and um, we'll incorporate some of that feedback in some of the future events that we're running as well. I'm sorry we couldn't answer um, any, uh, all of the comments. So firstly, um, thank you very much, Professor Peter Doherty for those insights. Um, it's been a real privilege um, to hear from you. 
So um, all of us at NARI and um, the people attending this webinar uh, really do are very grateful uh, for those insights. Um, before we do finish up, I'd also like to thank the NARI team and special thanks to Bianca, Deborah, Jessica and Esther. They make this, these kind of events happen. They're working hard behind the scenes so that we can have 200 people um, at these events. So um, the only thing left for me to say is that I wish you all a good evening. I look forward to seeing you at future NARI events and I hope that you've enjoyed this webinar. Bye-bye everyone for now. Bye-bye.